so we make a start. So today our topic is dry matter uh, accumulation and partitioning. So, um, so again, yield is a function of how much light being intercepted and how efficient it being used. So yesterday we thought was uh, light interception. So today we're looking at uh, how light, how efficient light being used, which is RUE total, and how um, those carbon being allocated to leaf, stem, and roots. So just start with our last experiment for 42 days cutting and give you guys some idea how it looks like uh, a season um, for our four, uh, five years experiment, what each season total yield looks like. This is shoot by mass for five years uh, for FD2. FD5 and FD10. Uh, the majority of the rotate uh, the years, there's no yield difference um, until the last year. There's yield difference. This is under 42 days cutting. So for the roots, um, we this is FD2, FD5, and FD10. So as you can see in the last year, year, the final year, the fifth year. So there's difference um, in compared to FD10. Um, so FD10 showed a drop of root by mass. Okay, so what it looks like in the field. So FD5, and you can see there's some gap of um, empty space uh, where the plant population is not um, great. So FD2, uh, the situation is slightly better at, than FD5. And FD10, um, there's hardly any lucerne stands. So we move back to our um, uh, calculations. So RUE is the slope of uh, linear regression of biomass against the accumulate total solar radiation. So here we use by mass, um, total by mass to calculate RUE total because uh, we, we want to catch both shoot and root by mass changes over the season. RUE total is a function of uh, mean air temperature. So if you look at my graph, there's uh, it start from lower um, uh, air temperature. We have a lower uh, total RUE uh, to increase to 1.1 at 18 degrees. However, our data set are, are quite scattered. So data points are scattered uh, from this two experiment. So we did the up boundary um, kind of regression and say, so this is the maximum we can get for in this environment is 1.56, which is close to what being reported historically. 1.1 um, uh, is a bit low than uh, what being re reported. So here's a, um, what it looks like in Epsom. So you put in a value of RUE. From zero, it will be zero um, because we only have data until 18 degrees. So 18 degrees is one. If we put whatever RUE value will be, or start from one from here at that exact value, let's say it's 1.6, will be 1.6 start from 18 degrees to 30, then drop to zero at 40 degrees. This represents a typical uh, cool season species RUE of, um, temperature response. Okay, cool. From this, we concluded that there's a linear regression, uh, linear increase from zero to, uh, from zero at zero degrees to um, 1.1 at 18 degrees. However, this value is lower than what's being reported. That's why um, a model optimization approach is needed to determine the most accurate RUE total, which we'll do in the following exercise. So I just want to um, butt in there for a sec, just to um, make that quite clear. So we've collected a lot of data 
and um, we were concerned that some of the rotations we might have been looking at may have had some slight water stress. And so the radiation use efficiency that we calculated from the field was lower than um, what was being reported. And so that's why we did an upper bound regression and said, look, let's put in the maximum values that we actually obtained. And that value was about 1.56. And that value was closer to what's being reported in the literature. But we all know that radiation use efficiency depends a lot on your calculation of leaf area and deception and, and those sorts of things as well. Um, so there's some variation around what RU, RUE might be. The other thing is we don't have temperatures higher than 18 as a mean. Remember, this is the mean temperature you were dealing with. So um, there may be values that are higher, but one of the issues that happens when you get higher temperatures is you also get higher rates of respiration. So you often have higher night temperatures. So your radiation use efficiency may actually decline. Um, here we're we tend to have warmer temperatures if we have a 25 degree day, which for us is you know, warm, not hot, 30 is hot, we don't go 35. Um, we often have a cool night. So we tend to have quite high radiation use efficiency because we retain sugar from low respiration rates. But the 1.1 that we calculated just seemed a little bit low and um, Edmar was quite keen on us running an optimization process. So that's the bit that um, Shima is going to explain now is what we did is said, well, that might be a bit low. Let's use the model to try and work out what we think the, um, the AUE might be, the maximum AUE might be and what that relationship may look like um, from the data that we've collected. So that's what she's going to explain now. Thanks. Um... Um, before we get into the optimization, let's just deal with leaf demand, the stem demand, and root demand. Um, so the first one is leaf um, dry matter demand. So leaf dry matter demand was um, parameterized as a leaf area index times specific leaf, area, uh, leaf weight. So um, so the daily leaf biomass demand is calculated based on can be extension, so this case is leaf area index and specific leaf weight. So here's a function of leaf weight against leaf area index. As you can see, there's a li linear increasing um, regression, but this, the data points are quite scattered from all this experiment that we, um, we measured. So on, this is because uh, specific leaf area is a parameter that depends on um, the growth condition, growth season and canopy and all sorts of things. So, um, so we conclude from this uh, leaf dry matter leaf demand is parameterized as a linear regression between specific leaf area and leaf area index in Epsom next generation looser model. Um, this is being used in many of the looser models and also used in other crops. Um, however, uh, specifically area did vary um, with development stage season and the growth condition. So um, there's more work to be done to find a more systematic uh, approach to model specific leaf area or another way to leave to measure leaf dry matter demand. Okay, then we will move on to stem dry matter demand. As a function, um, we, we test the few regression uh, against stem uh, shoot dry matter to determine the function for modeling uh, stem dry matter demand. So um, we found a very strong lean, uh, power function between stem dry matter and shoot dry matter. Um, so Shumay, yep. is that a botanical stem or is that the soft stem, hard stem separation? Uh, no, it's a botanical stem. So this, just the stem itself and leaf is just the botanical leaf. But this is when we were sampling 
we just strip the leaves off and weigh the stem versus weigh the leaf. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so right. it gives you a very strong relationship if you're doing that. Yeah. Um, okay. So if we implement so, that. Sorry, sorry, yep. Shume, can I, so uh, the shoot would be the aerial biomass accumulation. Would that be uh, what you call shoot deer? Yep. So it's aerial biomass accumulation. So total Whoa. aerial. Yeah. Yes. All right. Good. Cool. Um, okay. So if we implement that function into Epsom, this is what it looks like. Uh, so for, from here, we use a power function um, to predict um, stem dry matter demand. So move to the most interesting part of this talk. Um, so we have uh, as a perennial crop, so uh, Lucerne showed a uh, dry, root dry matter seasonal pattern. So here's our F, FD5 under 42 days defoliation for this five years growth. Okay, then uh, we have 28 days to, uh, defoliation and 84 days. So I'm just showing this graph to, uh, to say that we have a huge difference between uh, the three defoliation treatment um, from somewhere to, from two minimal to a, about 10 tons. Um, so, so the, the objective for this model is to capture this huge variation. Okay. So um, this is another, um, another experiment showing similar trend. So if we look at root biomass, as you can see from spring, it decreases to, to the um, middle of the summer, then increases in the autumn. So when for the period um, decreases, then we have a huge recharge of the root biomass. However, in the winter, uh, there's a slight decrease of root biomass, which we believe it's mostly root maintenance respiration. And this pattern showed again next year, although there's some variation in between. Hold on. Yep. yep. So it's it's quite important. There's two things that are quite important to pick up um, from this graph. So most of us have sort of experienced that um, annual pattern of a, a loss of, of root reserves and then an increase in um, root reserves in the autumn and the degree of that depending on both cultivar but and defoliation treatment. But the key thing here is that for us, once we get to about May, there is no growth. So the plant is sitting there with no, with really just a few small shoots sitting above the ground. And I suspect, you know, the, the guys from Patagonia, that's what it looks like for you too. Basically, there's nothing there. And so what Shumei did, which was quite clever, was said, well, we've actually got some root biomass measurements at the beginning of that period and at the end of it. And we can use those to calculate what was the respiration rate of the roots when there wasn't any shoots growing or there was no shoots um, photosynthesizing to partition or, or remobilize reserves. So she used the winter period to look at what the, the absolute rate of root respiration might be. And that's the point that she's probably just gonna pick up on now. Yes, thank you. Um, so yeah. Um, from the winter um, slightly decrease of um, root biomass, we believe it's um, respiration because there's hardly anything growing in the winter on the shoot biomass if you look at those red points. So um, we did the calculation, so the uh, root respiration loss. So this is the root respiration loss against the initial weight of, of root when we start the winter. So uh, there's a strong linear relationship. If you extract, 
extrapolate this linear relationship back to y equals to zero, I will give you a x intercept value. So y equals to zero biologically means there's no root respiration loss at that initial root biomass. So the x intercept value was two and a half times. So we conclude that um, so there's about two and a half ton of structural root biomass, um, which we used in the model. So uh, the majority of that decreasing and increasing uh, of root um, biomass after we dealt with structural root biomass, that will be uh, all, all due to storage root biomass demand. So um, there's three different factors or process which contribute to that uh, V curve. Okay, so the first one is root maintenance respiration. Um, and, and this is uh, mostly contribute to the decreasing of root uh, biomass in spring and early regrowth cycle due to increasing respiration to mobilize nitrogen. So that's the biological reason behind. So, and we also have root storage demand, which is different um, uh, in increasing and decreasing photoperiod. But we'll, we'll add some, uh, we'll deal with this specifically in the later slides. And also we have root remobilization, which happening. Um, so root, also carbon and nitrogen are reallocated to the new shoots to support shoot regrowth after defoliation. So the first one, maintenance respiration. And this is how we calculate root maintenance respiration. So uh, it's already considered soil temperature in this function and the Q10. And this is our uh, um, storage root biomass because structural doesn't respire, right? So um, because we didn't measure, we don't have any direct measure of root maintenance respiration. We use the historical literature being published um, from t 2009. So they said, um, it's more of a seasonal pattern. So from zero, um, it starts from the winter to summer, then to the autumn. So it shows a seasonal pattern because there's remobilization of uh, nitrogen costs. Uh, there's more respiration in the roots. So from this, we conclude that um, respiration coefficient um, changes across the season and uh, the seasonal pattern represents the decreasing root biomass in spring and early regrowth uh, cycles due to increasing of respiration, which mobilize nitrogen to shoot. We just might pause there and see if anyone's got any questions. Are there any questions to that point? Um, because dealing with roots is really a difficult thing to do. Uh, I would just like a, a more complete understanding of what it means, the respiration to mobilize nitrogen. What, what is that? What's happening there? You're burning carbon to shift the nitrogen around. So there's a lot of carbon required to move um, the storage proteins from roots to shoots in that remobilization period. So effectively, you're not moving um, a lot of carbon, you're actually using a lot of energy to shift the nitrogen from the roots to the shoots to start the regrowth process again with each regrowth cycle. But you're doing more of it in the spring when you have the remobilization happening from below ground. So is, is that transported as asparagine or as, as what, what amino acid or how is it transported? Yep. It's amino acid and people actually labeled nitrogen 15 
and, and there's a specific a few of them are the main component of that remobilization process. So, so it's it's that carbon that's attached to the amino acid that's being burned, as you say. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. As far as we can tell, we haven't measured that. That's yes, no. coming from um, reading some of Jeff Volnick's work and um, other people's work. But from what we can tell, the movement of nitrogen is actually causing the big burn of carbon from, loss from the roots. Human. I was just, uh, it's all numbers are uh, in the first uh, 30 centimeters are not corrected to one meter. It's just. Correct. The, okay. So we only, we dug to 30 centimeters. So when we're talking about two and a half tons of structural biomass, that's within the first 30 centimeters. That's a good point. And the other thing to remember is if you look at our data, it probably doesn't show how bad the FD10 crops were because one of the problems with, with sending casual workers out to go and sample roots is they're always going to go and select a part of the plot that's actually got some roots. And so we showed that in year five that there was a reduction in the FD10, but realistically the F10s had collapsed the year before but people go out and put the quadrat down where there's <laughs> some roots to dig and some shoots to get so okay so, yeah, yeah, yes yes when, when I see the picture when, when you show the picture uh, when you collect roots uh, in the in the five in the five year uh, you show a lower root biomass mm -hmm. this lower, lower value is because you have lower amount of plants or you you have more weakness plants more um, smaller yes smaller plants and, and weak plants what is the it, cause of this lower root yeah it's a good question it's mostly a, a drop in plant population and it's not lower partition it's not a, a partition change it's a we'll come a to cover. that because there's some different, because the partitioning change actually causes some cover changes, which causes some reduction in um, the, the biomass of those FD5s. But I guess what, why I asked Shumay to actually put those photos in is because you could think from the data that the FD10 was not so bad, you know, because the root biomass looked pretty good. But I think there's a little bit of bias in the sampling from when people went out in the field and collected the data that they looked for a plot where they could pick some roots. But actually, there'd been a much greater decline in the FD10s than we probably show up um, in the data. The photos are, are, are really much more telling. Um, and, you know, that's just the nature of people going out and collecting data and, and us saying, well, nobody wants to put a quadrat on a bunch of weeds and say that's my lucerne plot <laughs> yeah and on that point um so we asked people to pick up four rows and they couldn't find the four rows so they put the quadrat down and there's only two rows and they move the quadrat and dig another row so that's four rows of lucerne <laughs> yeah. yeah we have um data points from those measurements as well so yeah, so there's a bit bias and um, bias going on on the fifth years. And and really, the fifth year, the FD10 had collapsed. Uh, you know, it, it basically was a weed plot, and so we did a lot more uh, visual analysis that gave us probably better data than what we were getting out of the quantitative analysis. Even though the quantitative analysis also showed up that collapse, it, it was more dramatic than probably the data shows. And the other part to um, think about is the two and a half tons that we said that's the structural biomass. That is two and a half tons of structural biomass when you have a good plant population, when you've got ground cover and you know that, that was the value that come, came out as our structural biomass. As soon as your plant population drops, your structural biomass component is going to be less. All right, we'll move on, good. Yep. 
um, now it, there was uh, root demand, root storage demand. Okay, so uh, there's um, report that the petitioning to shoot, okay, was greater, uh, twice higher than in spring compared to in the autumn. And also I did um, RUE shoot compared to RUE total for both increasing and decreasing photo period in my thesis. So it showed this, this very much the same results. So in, in increasing photo period is almost double as what in decreasing photo period. Okay, so based on that, uh, we, uh, so for Epsom Lucerne, you have to have a maximum a storage root demand. So this is calculated based on uh, the structural root by mass versus um, uh, structural and storage root ratio. So structural, we just talked about it's two and a half ton. Uh, so we set a higher target to make sure 80, 84 days can reach a um, 10 tons to 11 tons of biomass. So the target here is 0 0.3. So which translate to uh, eight tons of biomass. Right, so for our storage demand, uh, storage root demand. So here's the increasing flow period. Uh, we are start from zero to 100. Then in decreasing for the period, it's 100% the whole time. Uh, so we are saying an increasing fold period, we only demand the half, which uh, half of this root biomass. And in decreasing fold period, we have this target of root demand the whole time. So um, for, so that's our stored demand. So for our remobilization, so here's the, Here's the evidence or historical um, uh, literature that report in the first two weeks of root growth, 12% um, of root carbon and 25% of root nitrogen were allocated into the new shoot. As we can see, the carbon percentage is smaller than the uh, nitrogen. Um, so other, also there's other research has reported that carbon was more um, more uh, being respired rather than showing up in the shoot uh, biomass. So for our remobilization process, we, has, we had the two different um, um, parameters. So the first one is remobilization coefficient. This is the root uh, biomass percentage, um, the story, the percentage of storage root biomass, which can be remobilized that day. Uh, and the regrowth coefficient, um, it, it can be called remobilization duration as well. It's defined as the um, uh, thermal time to, uh, since harvest to uh, when the remobilization stops. So uh, here's an example how that uh, rigor, uh, rigorous effect or remobilized duration works. So um, we are saying uh, from the beginning of the rigorous cycle, uh, we have 100% of remobilization happening until 250 degrees, degree CBs, then um, it drops to zero at 300. So, um, so we'll test those values for different full dormancy cultivars. So is there any is is there any questions from the remobilization? Yeah, yeah, Jose. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Jose. yeah, just um is is that also affected by photo period or is it independent of it? Which one, which process? Well, this process of uh, of no no the the, the last remobilization? slide. Yeah, because you say well it's going to be remobilized in, uh, until 300 uh, degrees, okay? Mm -hmm. So would, would that also be affected by photo periods? Say, if you're in declining photo periods, would that um, thermal time be longer? Would it be partitioning longer 
uh, or not. I'm wondering because this would make like this would make a huge uh, change. Well, it, it has already made a change, but for advisors in Argentina, I usually say, well, you have to wait for 10% flowering because of partitioning and, and because the plant is going to be replenishing its reserves. We're going to knock okay. that on its head shortly. Okay. I, so, okay. All right. So there's, there's uh, two things, there's two things happening and um, one of them is the, the very strong pattern that Shu Mei showed you of the photo period pattern, that, that we lose a lot of biomass in the spring and then we put a, a lot under the ground in the, in the autumn. But also within each cutting cycle, there is remobilization to grow the new set of shoots. So you've got okay. this overriding photo period effect that's giving you a change in partitioning. And yeah. we talked about that yesterday with Himan saying, you know, we, we showed that graph of the, the change. But also within every regrowth cycle, there is this period that if you've taken all the leaf off, you have to have remobilization. All right. Okay. That's and so nice. this at this stage, what Shume is, is showing is that she's saying that that period of remobilization within a regrowth cycle is about 250 thermal units. Okay. That's the hypothesis right. she's going to set up. And it's unrelated to flowering. Now we know that in the middle of summer, you may actually get flowering happening after about 350 thermal units. But what she's hypothesizing here is that this is not related to a change. Well, it may be, but visible, but there's a difference and that's what we'll come to. There's a difference in the duration of that remobilization period for the different full dormancies. Do you have a question? Yes, the, the, the remobilization uh, duration is um, independent of the residual leaf area, post cutting or post grazing residual leaf area. Here, uh, that's not the hypothesis. Taken into account. Okay. No, we haven't. We haven't said if we've cut to this height versus this height, is there a difference? Most of the data that we've looked at suggests that any residual is only giving about 10% um, transfer to the new shoots, that actually most of the new shoot growth is coming from the, the remobilization of reserves from the crown and the taproot, okay? But you're right, if you, if you leave no leaf area, then um, you may have a slight difference, but here we're assuming there's no leaf area and we've just, we haven't done anything on residual height. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So because we, okay, here's the, um, the parameters that we are not sure and we're not direct measured. So, so we did a optimization process. So the first one is RUE. Uh, so we tested range uh, from 1.1 to, uh, to people re reported at two. Um, so that's our range, it was one degree, in, uh, 0.1 degree interval. And also we have uh, remobilization in increasing and also in decreasing foot period. Our hy hypothesis here is that um, the increasing and decreasing foot period, the remobilization could be different, like Jose being pointed. Um, so, uh, so we test the values um, between 1% to 5%. Those are based on this people's um, uh, experiment and reports before. So um, we also have a re regrowth effect, effect coefficient. That's the duration of how long that remobilization happening after um, the regrowth cycle starts. So um, in my cases, we tested from 50 to 400 um, for different um, for dormancy classes. Okay, cool. So again, here's the model evaluation for uh, the result that we had uh, for all, um, parameter optimization. So you guys are pretty familiar with the slides. So we'll use excellence, excellent, good, fair, and poor um, to categorize our results. So um, here's our um, optimization um, results. 
so I know it's a lot of data point to look at, but so um, let, let's start with RUE. So the first one is RUE for FD2, FD5, and FD10. So I exclude all the values uh, below zero, unless you lower than zero being poor. So we're not looking at those. So, so from zero to 0 0.5, this range is fair. Above that is good. So as you can see, uh, our pink dots are shoot white, shoot white simulation. And the uh, blue ones are uh, root biomass. Okay, so our, it doesn't matter how you change our UE, our shoot simulation is always in the good range, which, which is a good thing. So then the, we're just focused on um, our, our UE that pr predicted root um, biomass. So let's start with FD5. If, as you can see, um, from uh, 1.6 give you the best um, fit for both our uh, shoot and root biomass simulation. And for FD10, um, and, and also for FD5, increasing uh, RUE from 1.6 to 2 doesn't really have any benefit of improve the model fit. So um, for FD10, um, F, you know, 1.6 gives um, probably the tight range of uh, both shoot and root um, model fit. Um, and also increasing RUE doesn't, doesn't really give, give any benefits. Um, for FD10, uh, for FD2, sorry. Um, so 1.6 is also a, a best fit for both shoot and root. So, and from this graph, we conclude that RUE equals to six will be our best um, choice. Cool. Um, for RUE, uh, for root remobilization and also root um, remobilization, increasing and decreasing for the period. As we can see for FD2, 5, and 10, uh, all of the value we tested, the model are not sensitive to this change. So um, each of one of them can uh, can give a, 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 the best or a similar results. Uh, so the only uh, so then we only have one parameter left, which is the regrowth effect, which is remobilization duration. Um, if you look at FD2, um, 200 to 250 gives the best uh, predict of root and the root biomass. And FD5, probably 250 to 300. And FD10, um, 300 to 350, uh, give the best fit of the shoot and root biomass. So, so in, in total, we had um, 36,000 rounds of model simulation. And here's the parameter that we pick that we believe it's the best fit of um, shoot both shoot and root biomass. So uh, FD5 to, to 10, um, RUE is the same, root remobilization and in increasing and decreasing fold period is the same. The only difference we have is remobilization duration. FD5 has um, 250 to 300, and FD2 has 200 to 250. And FD10 has the highest among those three. So it's easy to get lost around that process, but just think um, again, she did 36,000 simulations. And from those, it, it was difficult to say that the fall dormancy was causing any differences in the processes that we would associate with photosynthesis and respiration. So the RUE, the root remobilization in increasing and decreasing um, photoperiods. 
And if you think from a genetic and a physiology perspective, that probably makes sense. So when she had some small variations around which RUE to choose, we went, can we actually justify using a different radiation use efficiency for a different full dormancy? And it's pretty hard from a genetic and a physiology perspective to say full dormancy selections have probably changed photosynthesis responses. You know, that's a big ask to be saying that that's what the breeders have done. Um, so we were comfortable coming up with saying AUE is the same, which says photosynthesis and respiration are the same. Root remobilization is the same in an increasing and decreasing photo period. That's that overriding factor. But the biggest change was in the last column, which is how long do they remobilize for once you cut them? And so that part, it appears to be what the, um, the breeding has changed for the FT2, 5 and 10. That the duration that they spend remobilizing is different. Okay. Can be, can be related uh, to differences in residual leaf area between full dormancy cultivars? There, there really weren't any differences in residual leaf area in these full dormancy okay. because they were grazed. Yeah, and they topped after. And, and cut afterwards. So they all started from zero. Um, okay. So, you know, if, if I was thinking of which yeah. genes might they actually have, you know, what, what might the breeders have changed, then potentially some genes in the, here around their ability to respond to that cutting appears to be something that's come out. So I put a priority on shoot growth which is where we, if you remember the height thing we had earlier, they get taller. Well, their priority appears to be on shoot growth. Somehow that's what the genetic, genetic selection for the differences in full dormancies appears to be related to. That's our speculation and thinking around um, where Shumei got to, okay? So having three of those columns or four of them, I think the same, and then the last one different, we went, Physiologically and from a breeding perspective, we think that's what's happening. Genetically, the difference appears to be in the duration spent after you cut, remobilizing. Okay. This is the rigorous coefficient graph. If you imagine this is the start of the rotation, it's to accumulate zero thermal time to 350. So let's pick one FD2. So the red, so uh, the remobilization start from 100%. So it's 100% uh, from zero degree to 200 and drop to zero at 250. And the blue line on the bottom line, that's the root demand. When there's root remobilization, there's root, zero root demand. So those um, processes are opposite of each other. So even the maximum root demand in increasing for the period and decreasing for the period, doesn't matter how that change. We're saying that 200 degree CD, there's no root demand, okay? So for FD5, FD10, um, it's, it's the same as what it indicated in the graph. So FD5 is um, ze from zero to 250, drop to zero at 300 degrees. So it's, again, that's the same. Um, when it's remobilized, it doesn't demand. Okay, so maybe that's also make the root um, um, to pick up that, uh, v curve that we observed in in the um, ob, 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 observed the data set. So if we implement that into the model and what it looks like for shoot biomass prediction, so we had a fair to good prediction um, for all the treatment that we have, particular particularly for. Um, HH and LL showed a good agreement as uh, so short short day uh, short day cutting treatment twenty eight days um, showed a fair agreement um, for shoot biomass. If we look at root biomass, 
uh, it's overall it's a fair agreement. However, FD10 has trouble with most of the cutting treatments. Um, so what it looks like as a uh, line chasing dots. So the line is predicted and the green dots are the measured values. So um, for, uh, so that's our SL. So the, this one is LL, sorry, I couldn't see. Um, uh, so the majority of them um, captured the root seasonal pattern pretty well, even for our uh, HH, so 84 days cutting treatment. And for FD2, also there's some points are on, always on the top, um, but um, the majority of them are capture the variation and the seasonal pattern of root biomass. So from here, we concluded that our respiration coefficient changing over season um, to, uh, to response to uh, the um, remobilization happening in spring and also remobilization happening in uh, the early regrowth season, uh, regrowth period, uh, root, root demand. So we have a structural root of two and a half ton. Uh, in increasing for the period, there's 50% less root demand compared to uh, uh, in decreasing photo period. So uh, root remobilization, um, there's so root remobilization coefficient is the same in increasing and decreasing photo period, which is 1%. And uh, remobilization duration for FD5 is 250 and, and 200 for FD2 and 300 for FD10. And uh, all of them will decline to zero after another 50 degrees. So we conclude from all of today's slides. Um, so leaf demand parameter, parameterized as a power function of um, leaf area index and stem as a power function of shoot by mass. Um, uh, root by mass decreasing in spring due to mobilization and increasing um, in autumn due to changing partitioning. Uh, integrating remobilization coefficient, uh, root respiration function, and rigorous effect functions um, has improved the shoot and root by mass simulation for all of our treatment. Okay, so we can. Um, take questions. So my short interpretation of that with, um, I, I just want to comment that that was a huge amount of work for the shoemate to, to do that. It looks um, pretty easy, right? You know, it's it, it sort of, I tell her, I've talk, talk, told her about Occam's razor, you know, you, the complexity, and then we give you the simplicity. This is the easy part. Um, my easier interpretation of, of it is to say that the root is always demanding carbohydrate. And whether it gets it or not depends on if you've just cut the crop or not. So I've just cut the crop. If I'm in a decreasing photo period, the priority is remobilization. And so the plants will remobilize until they get to that 250, 300 or 350 part. And then the root will get priority from there. So there's a, it's always trying to get some carbohydrate, but at times there is a, you know, if you cut the leaves off, then the plant's priority will be towards re-establishing the canopy so that it can start photosynthesizing again. Once it's got the canopy, then the root is in charge and demanding the carbon and the nitrogen um, for underground reserves. And, and it sort of fits, I've done, I've been doing exact, I did a talk earlier last year um, around carbon, nitrogen, and, and the dynamics that happen for plants, and highlighting that when we overgraze, what we're actually doing is removing leaf all the time. And it's, if we're removing leaf, we actually cause the plant to prioritize to above ground biomass. And that's what's happened in the 28 day defoliation. Because we've continually removed the leaf and not given it that, remember Shumay said right at the beginning, her 28 day 
cutting periods are about 200 to 300 thermal units. So they, if you couple that with the cultivar differences and how long they need in their regrowth cycle before they start um, partitioning below ground, they virtually never get a chance. So it's effectively the same as set stocking a grass. And if you're set stocked on a grass or if you're constantly cutting lucerne, the plant will prioritize carbon to try and grow leaves. And so you will reduce your root biomass. And that's pretty much what we saw. Um, we see it in grasses and we see it in, um, in the, the lucerne work. If you, if you are short of water or you're short of nitrogen, then the first thing the plant does is actually stop prioritizing that carbon and start growing and partitioning water towards roots. So what we've seen here with the defoliation treatment, which was designed to put the plant under stress, is that it has lost root biomass, which is exactly what we would expect to happen. And the FD10, which took, takes longer, has been the most affected because it's the one that didn't partition below ground very much at all. So under a 28 day cutting treatment, it effectively grew its roots to death. It just never got a chance to. So if you wanted to, you know, the, the other thing that's interesting is that on our 84 day cutting treatment, which is horrendously long, the FD10 actually did quite well. So your management can actually override the genetic disposition of that plant to grow itself to death. And, and it comes back to when would you give it a rest, you give it a bigger rest in the autumn. It probably needs a longer rest in the autumn than an FD2 or an FD5 because it hasn't, during its rotations, it hasn't done anything to try and help itself survive. Yep, Jose. Um, I'm, I'm just, uh... This is sort of shocking because um, we, we, we tell the people that if we use FD10, you know, they can grace it, you know, they can use it in the autumn and not give it a rest because that's what it's meant to do. Now, with this data, what you're saying is the exact opposite. You're saying this crop is partitioning longer towards it's remobilizing longer, so we need a longer rest. And this is exactly what we're seeing we have a an experiment well, w the one you saw in per per pergamino and it's exactly what we're seeing we're seeing that the fd6 is working fine but the fd8 appears to need a second rest or a longer rest to actually recover its root reserves because it's never doing it it's mobilizing upwards all the time <laughs> and this is what's what strikes me with this is that why are we, at least in Argentina, why are we telling people to use FD10 and to not give it a rest because it doesn't need one? When in fact, if you want it to persist, you need it to rest. Yep. This is just, this is fantastic. Good. So, so the key data for you is then our 84 day data. When we left FT10 for 84 days, an extremely long period of time. And the reason I did that was actually because I went to China many years ago and people told me that in, in Inner Mongolia, they actually grow the plant about a meter and a half tall and they just cut it when they need it for their horse. And I'm thinking, what on earth is that doing to the plant? And the stands last forever because they're sitting there getting a rest the whole time and their root reserves must be huge. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I mean, FD, there's no free lunch. And so your FD10 is growing you that biomass, but in the process of doing so, it's depleting its root reserves. So if you want a crop to last more than, I would suggest the FD10 here was really only productive for three years. It, we made it look productive for four years, but actually it was three years. Um, by the fifth year, it was you could see the photos, um, and, and but it was actually okay. It wasn't great, but it was okay in that eighty-four day treatment for that long autumn period. So, I mean, I'm pleased. This what we've just described to you. Shume has just submitted that paper to as her third paper for European um, Journal of Agronomy. So, 
the concepts and ideas um, will be coming out in that, hopefully, if, if that gets accepted, but that's where it'll be. Um, but if anyone wanted to see a draft of that, we'd be comfortable to share that yeah. with you mm -hmm. to, to have a read. But it's really just going through the ideas we've had here. So I think the nice part about this is, you know, it's the first time anyone's tried to do that partitioning between above and below ground. It's the first time we've tried to pick up what the difference might be in FT2 and FT5 and FT10. Um, and if you look at the line chasing dot that she had at the end, it's not bad. You know, given that there's a lot of error when you're digging roots, <laughs> you put one root in or take it out, and there's quite a bit of variation in that root biomass digging. Um, that the processes appear to make sense and um, they appear to follow our observed field data as well. Okay, other, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear your FD6 is persisting and just needs one rest. That would fit really well with what Shume has just shown is that within every regrowth rotation, it starts partitioning below ground earlier. Therefore, if you've got them exactly the same length, it will have more underground reserve. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's that's what what, what our data is showing so far. And it's uh, it's going through the fifth year so far. So that's that's quite good. It's it's two. Well, the one you saw, FD six, yeah. FD eight, and two defoliation treatments. So yeah. it's it's looking pretty good. Yeah. Good. Okay. Are there other questions? If there's no um, more questions, Ivan, you got a question? Hi. Yes. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Derek and um, Xu Mei. I, I'm not sure if I pronounced it really well. It's a really enlightening uh, presentation. Um, here with my colleague Jorge, we have we are seeing the same problems, like the low uh, persistence of the plants. Uh, and uh, is this exactly the, the explanation that you are giving to us? Is Mostly, the most probably is <laughs> is probably is the thing that's happening here um, in uh, Patagonia. And I have one question about it. My my expertise is more focused on grasses, so I'm not quite familiarized with the legumes at all. And I'm not sure if, um, if because you uh, all the about remobilization data that. Uh, was show I found it really 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 interesting and my questions go a little bit like uh, same than Jose about the um, I don't know if you have data about the reserves uh, of, of the root uh, of these three defoliation frequencies that you made then if you have it do you see uh, like an increase of the concentration or quantity of, of these reserves um, I'm my question go for like if Lucerne have a maximum point of uh, when it reached the maximum uh, um, cons um, res uh, energy reserves of or some somewhere like that. Sorry about my rusty English. I have no, no, it have been a while. Fine, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, if you yeah. If, if you measure it, you fine. have you observed like a maximum point of accumulation in some with your difference yeah. 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 in no, the different frequencies. If you if you go back to that slide, can you see that slide? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yep. So yes. so what we're assuming on that slide is that the dashed line at two is the minimum structural um, biomass for a stand that when you look at it, it looks healthy. Okay, so that you've got a good yep. plant population. We think there, you know, that's the fiber and the lignin and um, the, the structural components of the, the plant. The rest of it is those reserves. So the oh, rest okay. of it is yeah. the other, you know, under the short yeah. cutting regime there, the 28 days, you can see that frequently we get down to that structure. We think there's nothing left mm. and that it's used all yeah. of those reserves. This is for an FD5, but under an 84 day, it's got about eight ton of uh, it, it maximum yeah. it's got about eight ton of, of reserves mm -hmm. so so we think the reserves can be well and truly manipulated by grazing management and there's 
I guess this is about showing the grazing management by full dormancy interaction. So yeah, there's, a, I mean, it's a huge, it's doing a huge, I think of it more like a tree than a grass because it's doing what a deciduous tree does. It, it's taking, generally deciduous trees are taking their nitrogen out of the leaves and putting it in the trunk. And that's why they turn yellow or beautifully red in your part of Patagonia. Um, so that they can hold that nitrogen. They don't really care as much about the carbon because they can make carbon, but they care about nitrogen. And I think the alfalfa, the lucerne is operating in a similar sort of way. Um, yeah. So huge yeah. reserve changes there. And as yeah. I said, Thank for you, the grasses, I use this example in a, a talk that I gave that's actually online from the New Zealand Grasslands Association, talking about what grazing does to grasses. And I used the example of a golf course because we had a, a, a gentleman here who was a turf grass expert. And I don't know if you have a Grostus brown top, we call it, a Grostus tenuous, horrible grass, really stoloniferous. Um, but that's what they use on the golf courses because they're constantly cutting the top, constantly creating a, re a reduction in carbon. And this plant that has reserves and just puts up a little bit of leaf survives and its roots are virtually nothing because the plant is constantly carbon short under that grazing regime. And if it's constantly carbon short, it will constantly try and grow leaves. And so you get less and less root reserves. If you look at that graph, you can see the opposite. When we're leaving the plant with a big canopy, it's got a, here it's probably got a leaf area index of five. There's senescence at the bottom of the canopy, huge amount of foliage. It says, what do I do with all this carbon? Okay, I'll keep sticking it under the ground because it's not short of carbon. Mm. So it just keeps partitioning below ground. And so it, it's very important to explain that to farmers who overgraze, that you create this problem of a drought because you've got no roots. So a resting period for all our plants is important and it's, um, you know, it's easy to show it here for the alfalfa because we traditionally rotationally graze it, but it's the same principles for our grasses. If you're constantly removing leaf, you're constantly requiring them to remobilize to reestablish that canopy. And therefore, they're going to become less roots and, and much more susceptible to um, drought or any other um, agronomic pressure that comes on them. And we'll share share with you another you very much of the reserve tomorrow, which is the nitrogen's reserve and the roots. Yeah. So tomorrow's talk is I'm okay. going to stop, but tomorrow's talk is about what happened to the nitrogen in the different parts of the plant um, as we went through. So we've basically gone through the phenology, then the light capture to get the carbon, and tomorrow we'll go through. So what happened to nitrogen? Where did it move, and what happened to it? Okay. Thank you very much for your answer. Uh, pretty, pretty clear, actually. Thanks. Good, good. Yeah. So unless there's further questions, I'll stop it there and thank you all for your attendance. Um, I hope that you found that interesting and um, we'll okay. see you same time tomorrow. Thank cool. you, guys. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jumei. Thanks, Jumei. Thank you. See you tomorrow.